Uh, so we're in week three of looking at deepening our prayer life. You know, that first week, it was just kind of an overview of what we're going to be talking about. And then we discussed last week, which is step one. And remember, there's seven steps to deepening our prayer life or uh, seven ways that it can help deepen our prayer life. Uh, step one, uh, you may not remember from last week. I, I understand that you slept since then. Uh, but it was just start talking, right? And, and we looked at Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, and how Paul there, he describes that God is near and he's fully capable of meeting our needs. God's not distant. He's not trying to escape us or anything like that. And he even tells us to pray about everything, that God knows what we need. And the reason that step one, and, and we'll connect these different steps, these seven different steps as we go along and get a little bit deeper as we go as well, is because many times when people look at prayer, they think that they have to use a bunch of words, that somehow they've got to use a whole bunch of $5 words when a dollar will do just to kind of break through the clouds, uh, you know, to heaven to where God will hear. And that can, be, that can be especially the case when we read through the Psalms, for example, and how eloquent uh, David seemed to be in many of his prayers. Or Moses in the Song of Moses, or or even if you're, and maybe it's just me because I preach, but one of the things I like to do is actually go back and read historical sermons from several hundred years ago, and um, you gain a lot of insight actually. But even then, just in the way that people preached, the way that people prayed. It was just altogether different. And so for some people, they might think, well, I've got to use a bunch of big fancy words if God's going to hear what I've got to say. You know, or they might feel inadequate or they might be someone who they've never tried praying before. And that alone could be a whole host of reasons. It could be that they weren't brought up in a religious household, Church of Christ or not. They weren't brought up in a religious household, so that's something that they're not familiar with. It could be that they were reared in a Christian home, but their parents or grandparents, whatever the case may be, never, never tried to teach them how to pray. And that can lead to, well, maybe the parents weren't sure how to pray either, or they just maybe told them, well, prayer is very personal. So just kind of pray personal. And that was kind of the extent of it. And so that's really why we're looking at it. And so step one is to just start talking. Because I'll tell you, you just opening up your mouth to talk to God is better than you not opening up your mouth at all. You know? And then tonight we're talking about step two. Step two is taking time to pray. It's just taking time. Or, or making the time to pray. So step one, just start talking. Step two, making time to pray. Over in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul writes, devote yourselves to prayer. Excuse me, I wasn't laughing, I was choking. Don't worry, I'm okay. <laughs> But Colossians 4 and verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Now, another way of saying this is commit to prayer and make it a part of your daily life. Right? Commit to prayer, make it a part of your daily life. The word devote there is that actually it means to continue to do something with intense effort. Right? It's about making prayer a priority. In your life is what Paul is saying to those in Colossae. Uh, if you are in a devoted relationship, what do you do? You take time to get to know the other person, right? There's an exclusivity there. You want to know their likes and their dislikes. And, and uh, you just want to know more about them. It's, you're, you make time to spend with that person. You know, maybe you were younger and you were dating or depending on how old you are courting someone, right? You know, because the younger ones, they're not going, what does courting mean, you know? But, but what did you do? You maybe had to say, I, you know, I can't go out with you guys. Maybe you had to tell your friends that because I'm going on a date. 
you know it's making time for that person you know and every year people make resolutions right uh, read more exercise read the Bible more that type of thing but, so what does that look like well if it's exercise then it's preparing yourself, right? Uh, you maybe go out and you, you buy maybe some running shoes or something, and it's there's a process, right? The running shoes sitting in the box and everything, they're not going to do any good. So you've got, you've got to lace them up. You've got to put them on, and you've actually got to open up the door and go outside. So there's a, there's a process of preparing yourself. But here's the thing. You set aside time for that activity. Right? You, you, you've made a resolution. You are resolved to doing this. You are committed to doing this. So you've prepared yourself and then you set aside time to actually follow through with that activity. Some people might run in the morning, some people in the evening, whatever the case may be. But you make time because that's now important to you. And it's something you've resolved to do. So that's what it is. Even an everyday activity, though, can also be a time of coming into God's presence and praying. The Bible doesn't tell you, look, you've got to get on your knees at your bedside to pray. It doesn't say you've got to uh, sit there and pray with your hands clasped like this. And believe it or not, you, you know, this kind of common thing we see, in, especially in like children's paintings of the hands in prayer like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But just kind of an interesting note is that most people actually believe that that folded hands came out of Christian persecution when the Christians and their wrists were chained together and they couldn't open their hands to pray. Because in the Old Testament, it was very common for them to, op uh, to pray with open hands. In the New Testament, Paul says, you know, for men to pray lifting holy hands. And really, uh, that lifting holy hands, it doesn't mean that you have to lift your hands up in prayer. It's that one, that you're not holding anything back, that you're, you're ready and willing to receive whatever it is that God has to say that you're not harboring bitterness in your heart that you're trying to come to God with a clean conscience that's just kind of a painting it with a broad brush but you get the idea and so you know any activity any activity really can be a time for prayer whether it's you're out walking in the morning or whether you're doing the dishes any time can be. It's about coming into God's presence, setting aside time for that. And we need to learn as well that prayer, it's not always about hearing, trying to hear something from God. And it's not always about trying to get something from Him either. It's, it's simply about enjoying spending time in His presence. The same way that someone else might enjoy just sitting on a couch and watching a movie. It, it, it's, you know, obviously not the same enjoyment there, but, but that's what it is. It's about just enjoying being in the presence of God. So many people think I need to go to prayer and I need to treat God like he's, you know, my little chihuahua at home, you know, that I lead around on a leash or something like that. I tell God what I want from him. And if he doesn't come when I want, then I kind of yank it a little bit and I try to coax God into doing something. You know, some people say, well, I've got to make some oath or promise or what have you to God. That's not it either. Prayer is about communing with our Heavenly Father. And we need to learn that it's not just about hearing from God. It's not just about trying to get something out of it in the sense of, hey, God, you know, I could really use that car, you know. It's about just enjoying His presence. Think about, think about it this way. Let's say Sunday morning services, right? It, you decide after that morning that you're going to go out with some friends from church to wherever. You're just going to go out to eat, right? Why are you doing that? Because you like, you enjoy being in their presence. You know, yeah, you're getting a meal out of it, but you're doing it. You could have gotten a meal without them. You did it with them because you wanted to get to know them more. You just wanted to be in their presence. Look at it the same way with God. 
in that you're you don't necessarily have to get something out of it it's because you want to be there have you you know with everything that the world throws at us we have to make space for god to be present and that's unfortunate that we act that life has become so fast-paced that we almost have to pencil god in on our schedules have you ever told someone you know we'll have to get coffee sometime or we'll have to go out to eat or something like that sometime how often does that actually get scheduled though rarely right rarely that time never really comes up you never set the date in the same way if you don't actually set aside time to pray chances are you'll probably never pray because you're not um, anything more than the, you know, Lord bless this triple decker cheeseburger with fried onions to the nourishment of my body type of prayer, right? You know, may my arteries be cleared and my cholesterol be low, you know. Can I get a large fry with that, right? And then we say to the nourishment of my body. So we have to set aside time. You know, our lives are busy. We get distracted too easy uh, that we don't even want to know or not sure how to pray naturally. If you want to get to know some, someone better, you need to spend intentional time with that person. Just like when you were courting, just like when you were dating. You have to set other things aside and say, I can't do this right now. I'm busy trying to do this. So if you want to have a deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus, you need to make the effort and set aside daily time to intentionally pray. And I'm not saying that you have to pray for hours on end and sacrifice all of your time. We Really, we can just look at Jesus in the early church. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do, right? Is to look at the Bible for example and command and inference. We can do that. Jesus' life was defined by prayer throughout the Gospels. And they didn't have to write this in. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they could have left it all out. But those writers, they were very intentional to write down how Jesus woke up before dawn, before anyone else, and went off away from everybody else to a secret place to pray, just to spend time with God. He could have left that out. Any one of them could. We have the Lord's Prayer, so we've got that model. They, they didn't have to tell us what time or how we did it or anything, but they wanted to make sure that, yes, there are communal times of prayer, like worship services, for example, or a prayer meeting, but there are times when you just have to make the time and get away from everything and just go to God. We have to set time for that. You know, he got up before dawn, before anyone else, so that he could spend time with the Father. And throughout the book of Acts, the history book of the New Testament church, we find miracles regularly occurring during prayer times. In Acts chapter 3, for example, I mentioned it this morning, but in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they're going to the temple. And it says it was about the ninth hour. And it actually says it was about the ninth hour, comma, the hour of prayer. See, in the New Testament, that those Jews that were still worshiping in the temple, so it's a practice that's forever old. There, there was a specific time of prayer that they had. That's where they healed the lame man, uh, the lame uh, man, not lime. I wanted to say lame and blind, and it came out that he was a lime. But the lame man was at a time of prayer in Acts chapter ten. Acts chapter ten. We're familiar, familiar with Cornelius because he's the first Gentile convert that that shows that Gentiles are now being grafted into this new faith. In Acts chapter 10, we see that it was at the hour of prayer that Cornelius saw a vision of an angel of God. So we see that. We see Christ's life of separating himself. We see miracles happen during times of prayer. A regularly scheduled prayer built around the biblical model of morning, noon, and evening is a great framework to build your prayer life around. 
And this is, you know, this is different than just before a meal or when you need something uh, or, you know, you step on a Lego in your bare feet and, you know, all of a sudden you got one of those instantaneous prayers of, Lord, please be with me that I don't kill my children. Something like that, right? But just following that kind of biblical model, remember, keep it simple. Just start talking. In the morning, a great way to start could be maybe with the Lord's Prayer that we read in Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 13 and Luke verse 11 or chapter 11 rather verses 2 through 4. Something simple like that. Many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, one of the practices of the church was to pray the Psalms. Have the Bible open and read the Psalm to yourself and pray the Psalm. Now, you might sit there and say, well, that's a written prayer. Is that really praying? No, absolutely it is. Absolutely. I mean, just look at how much David and Asaph and others, how they poured their hearts out into those prayers. You can easily make those personal. So in the morning, maybe the Lord's Prayer, praying a psalm or something like that. At noon, maybe set aside some time to offer intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is when you're praying on the behalf of someone else. You know that someone's struggling or someone's going through something. Take the time to intentionally pray for them. Too often, those types of prayers are regulated to like a Sunday morning family prayer in services or an evening prayer. Well, those people who come with prayer requests, whether in the bulletin, and I don't care if they've been in the bulletin for months, they need our prayers more than just Sunday morning and Sunday night. Set aside the time during the day to, to offer prayers to God on their behalf. In the evening, just walk through your day with God. Like I said, keep, keep it simple. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. I'm not calling y'all stupid. That's just the acronym. Take it for what you want. <laughs> but just start talking. Walk through your day with God. And you might say, well, that's kind of silly, isn't it? No. Walk through your day with God. Praise Him. Give thanks for the blessing. Ask for strength during your trials. Petition Him to draw you closer through His Word. Ask for mercy and forgiveness. You know, we might think, well, going through my day with God, that sounds kind of ridiculous. But then you've got to go back and remember what Paul said in Philippians 4, 5 through 7. That God is not distant. And that even though he already knows, he still wants to hear it from you. God knows about your day. But that doesn't mean you don't talk to him. You, you know, your kids, let, let's say your kids or grandkids, they, you know, let's say they're younger and they get up in the morning and they go to school, right? Okay, you know what? You know they got up in the morning. You know they went to school. You know they learned some lessons. You know that maybe they got some homework. You may know that they didn't pay attention to the teacher at all and were busy shooting spitballs. You know, that was me anyways. Just give me a straw and a wad of paper. But still, you ask, how was school today? You already know they went to school. But you, want to, you, but you want to know more than that. You want to know about their experience. You want to know about their feelings. Now, God knows how we feel. He knows about the experience. But again, he still wants to hear it. So step one, if you're trying to deepen your prayer life, and maybe it's been a while since you've prayed, just start talking. Step two, when you're take time. Make intentional time throughout the day to shut out the world and start talking. Because again, you don't want it to be with God like that. Hey, we'll get some coffee sometime and then it never actually happens. Do Work on those two things this week. Just start talking. I don't care if you're driving down the road. Just start talking. Sometimes it helps. Other people look at you. They think you're crazy. They leave you alone. Just start talking 
and slowly maybe you just need to start in this start setting aside morning time and then Tuesday you can add noon and then maybe Wednesday add the evening and just start slow progress that's what it's about it's not about perfection it's about progress it's about progression start with that and then we'll add that third step next week and if there's anything at all that I can do to help I'm happy to do that if you need the prayers of the congregation we will pray with you and for you under the throne of Almighty God if you want to talk afterwards you know I'll be here for at least 10 seconds <laughs> but I'm happy to do that as well if there's anything at all that you need and you'd like to make that known publicly you can do so by coming forward as we stand and as we sing <laughs>